Today, I have a special treat. We are going to be restoring a fantastic and very rare tool. But not this one. This one. This is the mythic Stanley No. 1, the smallest, rarest, and most valuable bench plane Stanley ever produced. The No. 1 is so small, there isn't even room for a lateral adjustment lever. These planes were made in small numbers, and very few of them survived. They're also undeniably cute, which might explain why they're so collectible. These planes typically cost $1,000 or more. I've got a pretty healthy collection of planes, but this is the first number one I've ever held in my hand. The last one I saw was in a locked glass case, and the seller wanted $1,400 for it. So, how did the world's rarest Stanley Bench plane end up in my shop? Well, a couple of weeks ago, one of my viewers emailed me and said, Rex, I just got a number one plane, but it needs significant restoration. Do you have any tips? And I said, yeah, I've got a tip. Box that thing up, send it to me, and I will restore it on camera. Problem solved. I haven't done a good metal plane restoration video in a few years, and I've learned a few new tricks. So in addition to being a video about Stanley's most sought after bench plane, this is also going to be an updated plane restoration video. And this is a good one to use because this restoration presents a few challenges. This plane is complete and undamaged, but it also has a lot more rust and dirt than you would like to see on such a valuable tool. I asked the owner what kind of restoration he wanted, and he told me to make the plane look as new as possible. Of course, I want to honor that request, but taking it that far might be a bad idea. I've seen a lot of rusty tools that were scoured back to bare metal, and they don't look good. Over-restoration doesn't fool anybody, and it ruins the value of a precious collectible. Throughout this whole project, I've got to walk a fine line between giving the owner what he wants while protecting this little piece of history for future collectors. No pressure. Any good restoration begins with careful disassembly. I always start by dabbing 3-in-1 penetrating oil on all the screw heads and moving parts. This plane is pretty frozen, and you don't want to force delicate threads, especially where there's rust and dirt. Now, you might be tempted to oil the screws that hold down the handles, but don't do that. Those screws are threaded into the body of the plane, and you can't reach that with the oil can. Throughout this restoration, I'm going to be using a bunch of solvents, lubricants, waxes, and abrasives, but I will link to everything down in the description. Now, you just want to take apart every little piece and put every screw and washer into a clean container so nothing gets lost. Once the frog is free, you can take off the adjustment wheel just by spinning it backwards on its post until it... until it... um... it should come right off. Hmm. So, the little Y-shaped yoke that moves the blade usually has enough travel to let the adjuster wheel pop right off. But in this case, it doesn't. I have never, ever seen this before, so I guess it's a quirk of the number one. Okay? Plan B. The yoke is held into the frog with a tiny, tapered pin. It's just a friction fit. So you find the wider end, get a punch that fits, and hammer it out. Hammer it out of a tiny piece of brittle, 100-year-old cast iron. Okay, let's go. The first few hits don't do anything, and it's easy to lose confidence. But you need to keep going with controlled, small taps from an appropriately sized hammer. Resist the urge to hit it harder. Just keep tapping until it starts to move. Once it moves a tiny bit, you have room to add a bit more oil, which helps a lot. After it starts moving, things go pretty smoothly. Pull it out with a pair of pliers and be very sure to put it with the other parts. After that, all the pieces come easily apart. The knob and tote usually come right off, even without lubrication. Now I can turn my attention to the body, and I've got my work cut out for me. The first step is a thorough cleaning with mineral spirits and a couple of small brushes. The owner wants the japanning left alone, and it's in surprisingly good shape anyway. There's a lot of dirt and maybe a bit of overspray. It looks like this thing got a bit too close to something that was being spray painted white. Still, most of the gunk lifts off without too much trouble. For the extra tough bits, I use a cheap pick, and I even use a screwdriver as a little scraper. I would generally never be this fussy for a tool I was going to use, but this is a rare collectible so I'm giving it extra attention. Next, I need to get the rust off the outside. I usually use a high-speed bench grinder and a medium wire wheel for this kind of work, but 
I'm afraid that's going to be too aggressive for this delicate little plane. Instead, I'm going to use this small, fine wire wheel in my drill press. This tool spins more slowly, and it's much easier to control how far you strip away the surface. I keep steady, light pressure against the wheel as I work off the worst of the rust. You could also do this with fine sandpaper. After the heavy rust is gone, I switch to this red Scotch-Brite wheel, which is much gentler. When I'm done, I've taken off the rust, but left a lot of the staining in the cast iron. This way, the tool is clean, but still looks like an antique. To finish the body, I'm sanding the bottom using a piece of glass to keep things flat. This isn't the final lapping, which I'll do later. I'm just getting rid of the rust and the paint splatters. Back at the drill press, the Scotch-Brite wheel takes the rust right off the lever cap. The cast iron here is heavily stained, but I'm not willing to be any more aggressive. This is an old tool, and age has just left its mark. On to the wood. The handles on this plane are made from top quality rosewood, and really don't need a finish. But they were obviously varnished at the factory, and that old finish has cracked with age. I want to be as gentle as possible in taking it off, but this 400 grit sandpaper simply isn't getting the job done. So here's a better technique. I lay a scrap of yoga mat on the bench and put a piece of 150 grit sandpaper on top. This gives me a firm surface to support the paper, but enough flexibility to allow the paper to conform to the curves in the handle. This setup removes finish more quickly, but it also prevents flat spots and helps to keep me from over sanding. For the details, I move my paper to the edge of the bench so that I can roll the tote as I sand and work my way around all the curved parts. Then I can move to 220 and finally 400 grit which would be overkill on anything but this dense, tropical hardwood. Once it's fully stripped, the tote kind of looks like garbage, but a quick application of boiled linseed oil is just the thing to bring back that rich, chocolate color. Rosewood is naturally oily, but this piece is old, and it needs a little help. Hand sanding the knob would be very challenging. This part was turned on a lathe, and you really want to preserve its perfect roundness. A good trick here is to take a bolt or a piece of threaded rod that fits snugly inside the mounting hole. Add a washer and a nut to the top, and then chuck the whole thing into the drill press. Because I have the power of the machine doing the work, I don't need aggressive sandpaper. I can go directly to red Scotch-Brite to remove the varnish, and then follow up with quadruple aught steel wool to remove scratches and give me a silky surface. Then, the knob gets the same treatment of linseed oil, and I leave both parts to dry overnight. The next day, I follow up with two coats of clear shellac and a coat of paste wax applied with steel wool. This gives the handles a very smooth feel without making them too slick. Now, Stanley frogs are rarely as flat as you would like, and since I took out the adjuster yoke anyway, this is a great time to lap that surface flat. This will give the iron more support and a better surface to fit on. There's no reason to go crazy here. Even a mostly flat surface is a lot better than what we started with. The last parts are the blade and the chip breaker. And for those, I'm going with my aggressive wire wheel. There's no reason to leave any rust on the parts that do the cutting, and it doesn't take very long because they're super tiny. The iron is badly chipped. It's one of the worst I've ever seen. So I hold the blade parallel to the ground and work just the edge on the grinding wheel. This way, I can quickly square the edge while minimizing the amount of blade in contact with the wheel and reducing heat buildup. This is also a good time to make sure the edge is perfectly square to the side of the iron. I always keep my tool rest set at 25 degrees, and I slide my iron up until it just makes contact with the wheel. I apply light pressure and constantly move the blade back and forth while feeling for heat buildup with my thumbs. I know a lot of people are nervous about ruining the temper on their blades with a high-speed grinder, but a patient and gentle approach combined with frequent cooling in water will give you a consistent, even bevel without any burning of the steel. This might be the lightest, most delicate blade I've ever ground, but I didn't have any problems. Now we're going to prepare the iron and chip breaker. These next steps are the key to good plane performance, so be a perfectionist. First, I need to flatten the back of the iron. If you use your sharpening stones for this, it might take half the day. So I start with 150 grit sandpaper. I hang most of the iron off the edge of the glass and put firm downward pressure on the end. You only need the last half inch or so to be flat, but it needs to be really flat. This one is mostly done, and I'll use my sharpening stones to finish that back to a high polish. You also need to prepare the edge of the chip breaker. Drop the body below your lapping surface and work that edge back and forth until you develop a bright knife edge that's square all the way across. 
Honing the iron is straightforward, and I've always used inexpensive oil stones for this work. I've got a whole video on my freehand sharpening technique, and a tutorial on assembling an inexpensive oil stone sharpening station. I'll put links to those down in the description. It only takes a few minutes to get that iron deadly sharp. While I'm at the stones, I'll continue to work the knife edge of the chip breaker, again keeping it below the surface of the stone. This work usually forms a burr on that soft steel, and I work the back of the chip breaker against my finer stones before stropping the edge, front and back. A polished surface will help the chips slide up and over the chip breaker. People often come to me complaining that their planes aren't performing very well. The biggest complaints is that the plane is jamming, clogging, or they're getting shavings in between the iron and the chip breaker. When you have any of those problems, it's because those two parts aren't correctly fitted together. So here's a well-prepared iron, and you can see that the edge is perfectly flat and well-polished. There are no low spots anywhere along that edge. Then with the chip breaker, it's been prepared to that knife edge that we just did. There are no burrs anywhere along the edge, and this curved portion here is well-polished. Once you have those two parts prepared, you can put them together and test the fit. I've got the chip breaker on top and the iron underneath, and I'm going to hold them up to a bright light. The Stanley chip breaker has a bit of a curve, a hump, right here, and that lets you see in between the two pieces. As I hold them up to the light, I'm going to look into that gap and look along the cutting edge. And that should be completely dark. I don't want to see any little bits of light coming through. The human eye can detect light coming through a gap about a thousandth of an inch, and that's enough to get little bits of shaving underneath these two parts. So you want to see no light at all. If it's perfectly dark all the way along, you probably have a good fit, and your plane is probably going to perform well. Now that we've got the iron and the chip breaker fixed up on our number one, we're ready to reassemble. Now I need to get that pin back into the frog, and that could involve a lot of guesswork. But I took a picture of the frog with the correct orientation of the pin, and my pliers left light marks on the wider end. So it's easy to figure out which way it goes. Everything needs to be reassembled before the pin goes in. But it's all clean and well oiled, so that's easy. I clamp the frog to the edge of the bench, get the pin started with my hammer, and then finish it off with a large punch. Using the punch lets me direct my hammer blows right onto the pin and eliminates the chance that I might miss and hit the fragile edge of my frog by mistake. The inside of the body is as clean as I can get it, but it still doesn't look great. So I'm going to apply a bit of paste wax on a Q-tip and buff it with a paper towel. Now I've restored the color and the shine. This is the best we're going to get without stripping the japanning and starting over. Now it's just a matter of screwing everything back together. I've taken a lot of time with all the individual parts, so there are no surprises. Remember to put a dab of oil on any threaded parts, so the next person who works on this plane can get it apart again. Oh, quick tip on the frog. This plane doesn't have a frog adjustment screw, but lots of planes don't have those. So to get the frog aligned, I just use a little steel rule to make sure I have a straight line down the frog to the back of the mouth. I set it by hand with the screws a little bit loose, recheck it, tweak it, and tighten it down. It's really not difficult. With the plane assembled and the iron retracted all the way, I do the final lapping of the bottom. The plane needs to be under tension when you do this, just like when you're actually planing wood. This plane has some unusual wear at the toe, but that's not going to affect performance, especially since the rest of the sole is dead flat. This plane is pretty much done. After all this work, it makes sense to ask, what is the ultra-tiny number one even intended for? What are you supposed to do with it? I mean, the obvious answer is that it's for holding in one hand and for doing small parts, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. You could just use a block plane for those tasks, and block plane is roughly the same size and much more comfortable to hold. So I don't think that's it. Some people have suggested these planes were actually intended for children who were learning the craft of woodworking, but I don't think that's true. James Wright did a great video about his own number one restoration, and he actually had his five-year-old child try to get her fingers around the handle, and she couldn't. There wasn't enough space. So I don't think these were for children. Here's my best theory on what's going on. I have a lot of wooden planes, a lot of coffin smoothers, and the smallest is this one here. It's quite tiny. And if I take this one and the number one and match them up, well, they are exactly the same size. Like down to a sixteenth of an inch. 
What I think happened was when Stanley went to make their complete line of bench planes, they just went and found every single wooden plane they could find and copied all the sizes. That's why there are eight sizes of these. Well, 11, really, but a lot of them. Stanley just copied everything. I think this is the smallest wooden plane they found, so they made a copy of it. They were in business. Anyway, enough talk. Let's check out the final product. Here's where we started, and here's where we ended up. Man, that was satisfying. I mean, for me, this restoration was a little bit ridiculous. I usually just get them up and running, and I don't worry too much about all the little cosmetic details. On the other hand, this video has pretty much every single trick I know, so you can do as much or as little as you want with your own restoration. For me, I'm most concerned about performance, getting the plane cutting. So does this number one cut? It sure does. This plane is nearly impossible to hold, and I am terrified that I am going to drop it on my concrete floor. But it cuts a feathery shaving and leaves a beautiful surface. This is what you would want from any size plane. So it is no secret that I like old tools just as much as I like furniture building. Sometimes I like them even more. Old tools are just, they're fun. They're interesting. So getting a number one should have been a huge thrill for me, especially because I'm a massive Stanley guy. I own tons of their planes. And when I got it, I felt well, nothing, really. I just wasn't that excited about it, which is weird to me. When I got my Norris A5, a super famous legendary smoothing plane, when I took this thing out of the package, I literally felt chills go up and down my spine. This is a famous historical tool, completely different construction than the planes I'm used to, and actually useful. I've built pieces of furniture with this. This thing really gets my blood pumping. The number one, not really. I think because, well, you can't do very much with it. I know, I know, some people use number ones for things. I get it, but most people don't. This one, you can see how much iron there is. It's pretty much never been sharpened. I don't think this plane saw a lot of use because it's not very useful. If you buy one of these, it's probably going to sit on a shelf. And for me, tools that sit on a shelf just aren't that interesting. I'm not going to spend $1,000 on something that I can't use. I'm going to save that money and spend it on cool old tools that I can build furniture with, which is even more fun. Anyway, if you like restoration videos like these, I have a ton of other restoration videos, including videos about fixing up pretty much every type of plane imaginable. And those are all linked down in the description. I also have to mention my new book, Everyday Woodworking, a complete guide to woodwork for absolute beginners. I am very excited to say the first printing of the book is already sold out. Thank you so much for that. The publisher has rush ordered a bunch more books. They are going to be in stock again very soon, and you might as well order the book now. That way, you'll lock in the low price that you can currently get on places like Amazon. They're selling it at a big discount. So go ahead and order it now, and you'll get it when it comes in. Just like always, I have to thank my patrons on Patreon. They make these videos possible. And they're also an amazing, supportive, friendly group of craftspeople. I'm really proud to have them on my side. If you'd like to be one of those people, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out all the rewards and early access I have for the people who make these videos possible. I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching.